now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Serfolio, the 2021 recipient of the SMD Alumni Council's Distinguished Alumnus Award. Dr. Serfolio is Executive Vice President, Vice Dean, and CEO, COO of New York University Langone Health. He's also Chief of the Thoracic Clinical Division and Professor of Cardiothoracic Surgery at NYU School of Medicine. And he's the director of the NYU Lung Cancer Center. He will be presenting today on scaling the ascent to the summit of mastery. For questions during this session, um, staff will bring microphones um, to anyone who has a question or comment and the virtual audience can continue to submit via chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, uh, rather than be behind the podium, I'll just walk around and make a little more informal. So first of all, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to be here. I also want to thank my mother, my 91-year-old mother, who made the trip from New Jersey. And uh, the love of my life, my partner, Tammy Sheree, if you want to just stand up and say hi. Part of this talk is a little about adversity and resilience. And I was married for 21 years with three boys, and my wife got cancer, and my children watched her pass away. And we had a wonderful marriage. We learned from that. And Tammy lost her husband to cancer as well. So there's always a bright, there's always a silver lining in every cloud. So I think when we talk about an ascent to mastery, everyone in this room has many, many roles, your moms, your dads, your brothers, your sisters, your daughters, your sons, and you want to be the best at that. And how do you do it? Uh, and I, I have to give a conflict of interest because I've written three books. And since the lawyers tell me I have to do it, now I just use it to publicize my books and tell you how you can buy them. So this is a picture of actually the cover of my third book. And I think the message here is we're all trying to ascend to be the best we can. But instead of doing maybe what I did early in my life as an athlete, I was a baseball player here at U of R and, and played the hockey as well. Instead of kicking dirt on people to get first and be at the top, maybe you lift a hand and help them to get up. And then how do you scale that? If you want a competitive edge, we have 60,000 employees at NYU. Every doctor I meet is a world expert. Can't be, but they all are. How do we scale that they can help their partner? And I think that's what this is about. So I have no conflict of interest except for the books and a patent. Uh, I am very lucky to have multiple international visitors in my OR all the time. We missed them during COVID. They're back now. They're great medical students. Um, we have college students from Brazil. And then we have famous professors from Singapore come. Anyone's welcome to come. That's my email, my phone number if you need me. So my first book was a little bit about life's lessons in this and then my wife's pathway and how my humility of learning that I could operate and do 10 cases a day and those patients would do well but we couldn't help my wife get through her cancer and how you learn from that and how my three sons have learned from that, all who uh, were captains of their baseball team and all recruited by division one baseball. And then to really scaling this over an organization <clears throat> in heterogeneous groups. And how do you scale that desire? Well, we're gonna show you what we did in a medical center and how it's worked in a small medical center. Now can we do it across the continent? I don't know. So I believe very strongly in engagement, that if you work for us at NYU and I don't care about your mission at home, you sure the hell are not gonna care about my mission at work. I have to care about you. That's hard to do when we have people that work in the cafeteria, some are cash registers, some, some just make hamburgers, some just make other types of foods, and I have neurosurgeons. They're all different backgrounds, but yet that's what I think we have to do. So we have to find ways to engage people in a culture that's positive. All of us are part of a family, a community, or an organization. And the question is, can we capture the hearts and minds and spirits of our team? And I heard Mark talking, and maybe he has here at U of R, but we haven't at NYU. In fact, COVID has made this more difficult. We have not captured their hearts. We've lost a lot, not just our nurses, but many of our doctors as well. And I think it's a little bit like your children. <clears throat> I can tell them I might not like you very much today. I still love you, but I sure the hell don't like you for what you just said or did. And I think this is why I think the litmus test of employment engagement is so important. We all have a desire to be the best the best at what we do, the best version of who we are. And when many of us have all these different roles and they change, I've seen how my role has changed as my mother has gotten a little bit older, 
uh, and I'm not helping her as much as she's still helping me, but maybe there's a little bit more of the reverse. And then the question is, what is your level of dedication to achieve that goal? I think this is where there is a difference in culture and perception. Are you really willing to do the work to be the best at this role, X, Y, and Z? Or maybe not. Maybe you're happy to be an average spouse, but a great doctor. Is that acceptable? Or a parent, is that acceptable? Only you can decide that, but how do you do it? I don't think it is. I think your most important roles are the roles in homes, of course. And then how is it measured and what is the process? So being a child in my house was difficult because I got into metrics and measurements very, very early from when they were three, four, five, and six and got into this. And it's interesting, I just, uh, you know, I think about this week, I gave a lecture to a thousand surgeons and asked them how many in this room are below average and not a single hand went up. I said, isn't that funny? Because 500 of you have to be, but of course not a single hand went up. Uh, and there, I got 27 world experts just in one division. That's not possible. There's no shortage of this in medicine or really in society. And it reminds me of a story when I had, I came home from a long day of work and, and my, uh, my oldest son, I come and said, how was your day? He said, it was good. And it was Father's Day. And he gave me this mug. And I said, tell me a little bit about this president. He described it. And I said, son, this is the dumbest, most ridiculous present I've ever seen. What are the metrics? How did you measure it? How was that even possible, et cetera? My wife came in and said, Robert, he's three years old. Give him a break. And I said, I will not. It's time this kid gets a job and starts working. What is he now? He's now the youngest executive in Major League Baseball, works for the uh, Cleveland Guardians, used to be the Indians, went to Yale, was a lefty pitcher, got drafted by the Dodgers, now works on the other side of baseball and is married and maybe is going to have their first child. So I'll finally be a grandparent. Finally, <laughs> yes, we'll see. Um, and then I think about baseball and things like batting average, which many of you know is the worst metric in the world. So when my kids were young, we measured exit velocity. But baseball has wins over replacement. Do we have that in medicine? Do we have wins over replacement? No. We look at mortality, morbidity, but of course we do the highest risk patient. Every doctor complains that's unfair. Why did I get this complication? It was a blood clot, it doesn't belong to me. There's no accountability. So we think the single most important thing and the main focus of my talk today is about a thing called an EQI, an efficiency quality index. The EQI is the war, if you're a baseball fan, the wins over replacement in baseball. It is the ultimate metric that drives accountability and makes doctors provide better care for their patients. And for me, I measure citizenship, teaching scores, behaviors to nurses, uh, behaviors to uh, your staff in your office. We can measure anything. We can drive your behavior based on what we measure it and how we report it. And I submit to you, that is how we're going to win this. However, unless you have captured their heart and convinced this extremely accomplished, and I'll just say orthopedic surgeon, who's world famous that he or she needs to get better, it doesn't work. And you have to convince them that what is the change for? Is it for them? Is it for their ego? Is it for their wallet? Do you tie money to the EQI? We haven't yet, but maybe we will. Is it for their trophy case? What drives them? Is it for the team? We believe the thing that drives people more is community and a larger mission. We generally and honestly believe that that is a bigger thing that drives people. But you do have to tie some of these other things to it. I won't bore you with some of my research, but we've written about specific granular substrates of people that we think are the factors that make changes. And that is, what is their self-awareness? How nimble are they in changing? What are you asking them to change? If you're asking them to go from being a righty to a lefty, that's difficult. If you're asking uh, my uh, junior attending, who's a 34-year-old robotic lung surgeon, just to change her angle going around the pulmonary artery, which she's now done in the last three times of the video review, we're getting better outcomes and there's less injuries. That's an easy change, but that also requires engagement, both by her and by me. Who benefits? There's no benefit for her for that. The benefit is the patient, which we all say we're here for, but are we? Are we sure that's what we're here for? We should be. And what are the executive outcomes of this? Is it all about money? Absolutely, profit's part of it, but it has to be a much bigger mission than that. And then finally, uh, I'll just describe the different coaching languages. Again, something we've published, a theory of mine that like love languages, there are different coaching languages. I've coached 53 little league teams in multiple sports. 
played a lot of sports and found this with our residents, fellows, medical students, and you can read that there are different ways to engage. So you as a teacher or mentor have to decide very quickly what language you're going to use for that particular person who's come into your organization to engage them. And it's a little bit different for all of them. Again, it's like leadership. You may have 14 different clubs in your bag for leadership and you have to be able to swing all those golf clubs, but it's about club selection. When do you need to be authoritative? When do you need to be affiliative? When do you need to be a pace setter? You need to know when to draw those clubs out, but they all have to be in your bag. I think once you've captured the combatant's heart, you've won. You've started their climb towards mastery. And the best part about this is that destination, of course, is unachievable. That's what I love about it. That's what I love about surgery. That's what I love about parenting. That's what I love about relationships is you just always want to get better. And you'll never get there, of course not. But the, the climb and the, the toil and the obstacle and overcoming those things is what makes it great. It's what makes life great. And then how do you challenge it over a diverse group of people with very different backgrounds and educations, especially in an academic hospital system? How do you do this? So given that backdrop, this is what we've done. And I thought this would be a better talk than looking at pulmonary artery slides or looking at other ways or education and we get everybody drawn into this and tell you what I think we've done to change a culture to improve patient outcomes. First, you have to engage doctors. And I'm gonna just talk about the doctors now for just because they only have 20 minutes for this talk today. And I could not get 12% of them. 12% were not engaged. They did not believe they needed to get better. And we lost them. And they got upset by the fact that I was coming to their grand rounds as a COO and putting their name on a slide. And Mark, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and showing them where they ranked in length of stay, uh, mortality, complications, surgical infections, or for the medical doctors, overall outcomes, readmissions, and putting their names up and showing it. It was an open, transparent way, showing some stats that weren't perfect, and hence we developed the EQI. It only occurs if you have accurate data, because no one wants their name to say they're in last if you're measuring something that A, doesn't matter, or B, is incorrect. Once you've given a doctor incorrect data, you've lost them for five years. So it's much better to give them no data that shows them they're not performing well than incorrect data. Each one of these are a, a lecture that we talk about and how to engage. I won't get into them today, but tell you this is really the key to the lecture are these factors and metrics that we use. And it really comes down to positive and encouragement. You can't have those that are in the bottom 10% and you can't make them feel that they're not part of your team. We still love them. We still want them to get better and we don't want them to leave. We don't want them to be publicly embarrassed, but we want our patients to get better care. So what is the EQI? So if you have the correct culture, it leads to desired outcomes. And first, I'm gonna show you the outcomes we've done and then how we do it. So it just started really with me as a thoracic surgeon. I got to do 500 operations a year, then 1,000, then 1,200. I got to do the most in the world. We had the best results in the world, and it wasn't about me, it was about my team. The problem is I had three partners and I couldn't scale it to them. So we weren't getting a three star in the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, which is the most accurate report card for lung cancer surgery in the world. Once I got out of my ego and checked the hubris and had a little humility and spent more time teaching my partners and stuff, within a year, we became one of the only 5% of hospitals in the United States that became three stars. This was when I was at the University of Alabama. And for the next eight years in a row, we were three stars in lung cancer surgery and cardiac surgery. When I got to NYU, they had never been that for 21 years. We've been that for the last five years in a row for the five years I've been there. How did we scale it? Well, doing the things I said, but it was very easy in lung surgery. How do you do it now across a campus, across an organization? So we started doing this. Now this slide is busy, but I wanna point you to the metrics at the top. So this will show the number of discharges per, phys per physician. Actually, everyone's name was supposed to be blacked out. Look at that. <laughs> okay, good enough. We presented it good enough. So we did it publicly anyhow. But um, yeah, my box went away. Maybe if I hit that, no, too bad. In any event, it shows the physician's names, not doctor one, two, three, four, or five. And we did this publicly at Grand Rounds. It shows your number of discharges, your observed to expected length of stay, your discharge is before noon. Why does that matter? One, it's better for the patient to go home by 8 or 9 a.m. All my patients leave at 8 a.m. 
If there's a problem, their home pharmacies is open, we can fix them. You don't leave them in the afternoon. Two, gets people out of the operating room and people out of the ER. We have no delays in the emergency room or the ORs because of early discharges, and we publicly report it and drive behavior. Hospital mortality, observed to expected mortality and readmission rates. And actually the slide that I had for some reason just had my name showing and no one else's, but you can see that even though I am you know, a full-time administrator when this was done, which I'm not now, but I was then, I was a pace setter with the lowest length of stay, the highest discharge before noons, nobody died in the less than 5% readmission. But that leadership doesn't work because all that does is show your partners that you're better than them and it doesn't engage them. You have to do the opposite. It has to be affiliative and share your patterns and pathways of what you do to get them there. This definitely drives behavior when it's put up on a board in front of 500 doctors. And I think the message, the message is simple because some people just can't do it, is that is we want to be very tough on our standards, but soft on people. Everyone fails. We're all going to fail. No one has failed more than me. Unfortunately, I am the king of that, but I still hope that people love me and that they know that I'm doing the best I can for them and for their organization. Then we took that concept that we did in a division and then a department and then in a cancer center and put it over the hospital. And this is what we've been doing at NYU. Uh, and our dean, Dr. Grossman, loves these slides. He wanted to make sure I was showing them that shows compared to the University of Pennsylvania and Mayo and Emory and all these other prestigious hospitals that we have the best observed to expected. Now, is that because we're coding the expected better? Sure, a little bit, but that's part of it. It's really also about the observed. So if you're not listing all the patient's comorbidities, then you're not gonna drive up the E. So it's a combination of delivering great care, but also making sure you code all their comorbidities so you can get this. And if you do this, we made a big splash with the tuition free that we talked about, but I personally took a lot of heat for this every time I went to a town hall from all the other uh, members of our workforce who wanted to know why nursing school wasn't free. I'm like, well, I didn't give the gift. The gift was given to us just for the medical students. Well, they didn't buy that. Uh, and our surgical techs were very upset because many of the medical students were, were uh, children of affluent families and the surgical techs are not. And their points are well made. And I agree with them, but I could not change how the donations were made. I think you have to stand there and answer their questions. You have to be honest and transparent, but it was not popular. And when I took the job, we were 19th and now we're two. And part of this is driving you know, our medical school towards metrics that matter. Now, does this make our medical school better because we're ranked number two behind Harvard? If you got rid of reputation factor, we would be one. Uh, if you look at all those things that matter, maybe, but I don't know because as a vice dean of a medical school, I still know that we have two or three medical students every year that really struggle. Mark, I don't know if you have this, but it's amazing. Uh, when I was in medical school, I think one or 2% of the students sought counseling and now it's about 40%. So it's actually part of what we teach. Part of this is cultural, part of this is um, perception, but part of this is the reality of our workforce. And then there's other more objective measurements such as Visient. Does anyone in this room know Visient? Uh, I, I know Mark, you do. Anybody, does anybody else know? So this is probably the most objective measurements of outcomes. I was on their executive council for four years. I'm not on it now, but they really drove patient outcomes. And we were always one or two in that for the last five years. Now we're going down a little bit lately, but that measures real honest to goodness outcome. We also use it for our workforce, Mark, to say how many nurses we should have here or there. U.S. News and World reports a lot of reputation. Leapfrog is self-reported, so don't be impressed with the A. But the CMS star rating is impressive and difficult to do. And these shows that these are targets that we said we were going to drive for just like when I played baseball here, I wanted to hit 10 home runs a year and bat 350 or have an exit velocity of X or drive my EQI up, which is what we're going to talk about now. So I started this actually with my children and, and my mother is going to laugh and Tammy will laugh, but I had three boys and I would tell them I wanted them to go clean the garage. And part of that is if it took you an hour, you were doing something wrong. And if you took it two minutes, you were doing something wrong. So it should be a maximum efficiency with quality. That's what it's about. So I think everyone in this room has a repetitive action. Most of you got up this morning 
shaved or showered or got dressed or whatever you do, you do that every day. Uh, you, are you sure you're getting dressed in the most efficient way? You might not be. Are you sure you came to work? Now, maybe today you didn't come to work the way you normally do, the same way, but most of us do. Do you brush your teeth the most efficient way with the highest quality? You probably don't. And if you're a surgeon like I am, and I've done 19,000 operations now, am I really doing a robotic lung cancer surgery the best? Probably not. I'd love to get better. The only way to do that is to look around and talk to other people. So time and quality. And quality, when you're a physician, is observed to expected length to stay. That's the number one determinant of cost is being in the hospital. Readmission rates, uh, FCOTs are called first case on time starts. We put that up. If every surgeon was one minute late, once a quarter, I took their OR away from them. Didn't make me popular, but boy, no one was late to the OR. So right after I became COO. Operative notes had to be dictated in 24 hours, not 72, 24. We think medically, legally it's better. And we just think it's better for patients. So once we started doing that, the lawsuits went down. Those are metrics we put on you. But I am not going to tell a psychiatrist what is the best way to handle a schizophrenic. And I'm not going to tell an orthopedic surgeon what are the quality metrics of an ACL repair. We'll allow you to tell us that. That's sort of the EQI. We allow the participants to determine the best metrics of quality. We allow them to vet their own data to make it correct. So when they said, oh, this stupid administrator, Sir Folio, gave me these metrics. He's got me doing a cholecystectomy. I'm a heart surgeon. Eh, wrong. I gave you your data. And you and the eight people you compete against with have the chance to change your data if they agree. If they say you can't get rid of that data point, then you can't. But if you can, you can. And we let you iterate your game and improve the scoring system. And most importantly, it's supposed to be fun and collaborative. It's not about saying someone's in first or last. It's about saying, we want to give patients better care. And if you measure 20 things, there's always someone who's at the top and someone's at the bottom. So the overall lowest performers, I always let them go first and say, how did you win this, this, or that metric? And the example was CMI, where I was never the highest and one of our other surgeon was. We improved everyone's score. And if the score metric really measured quality, and patient experience and behaviors and, and culture, it was a win. So in the last few slides, I'll show you how we did it in lung cancer surgery six years ago, and we've iterated it. We looked at 30-day mortality. And as you can see here, let me see, does this work? No, I have to do this. So no one should ever die after a lung cancer operation now. So this is very severe. If you had a death at 30-day, 2.5 index weighted on the score, or even at 90-day, two. Hospital acquired conditions, blood clots, fevers, none of these things should happen. Surgical site infection, your HCAP scores, we put very high because we thought the satisfaction of the patients really mattered and patient experience mattered. If you're a great surgeon, but you're a jerk and persons, the patients don't like you, we're going to hammer you on your EQI. And it goes on and on. Observe to expected length to stay, readmission. These are your charges. I use a robot, a little more expensive than VATS, but overall, we showed the value, your time in the OR, and then your teaching score. So if you're gaming the system and not letting the resident or the fellow do the case, your teaching scores would go down and you got hammered there. Or if you were just a jerk to everybody pushing everybody, you got hammered on your overall citizenship scores, which we got once a month from members in the OR. And other quality metrics such as lymph nodes, lung cancer staging, return to OR, all these came into a score. And then you got a overall score for that surgeon, for that procedure. And you could do this for everything. You can do it for a hospitalist taking care of a diabetic patient on ECMO. I had the head of dermatology tell me on our first meeting he couldn't do it. But by the time we met the second time, he understand that we had to do it and we got it done in dermatology. You can do it everywhere. You can measure it in everything. And it's a way for us to get better. And this just shows the departments and what they've done and where they are and what's been published. So I would say, because I don't want to overstay my welcome, that if you're leveraging meaningful data that matters and you're measuring things that are clinically important and you tell us what they are, for instance, you can't hide under that like you can't hide under the lights of intraoperative videos. And then we document MD variability. And this is the big thing that's gonna be hit on over the next five years is why is one doctor doing something so much less expensive than another? There's a reason for it. We gotta to come together and figure out why. This is how we can scale everyone's ascent to mastery. So administrators and doctors 
C-suite employees, we're all on the same team. We all want the absolute best outcomes for our patients. Yes, profits are part of it. If there's no money, there's no mission. We have to be in it together. But we have to provide the highest value, not just to the customer, the patient, but also to our employees. And that is going to be challenging because our costs are up exactly as you said, Mark. Our traveling nurses have quadrupled our costs like yours. Uh, that's not going anywhere. And it's caused great angst. Why would the nurses who work with us the longest time be happy getting paid a fourth of what the traveler is or 25% less? It's not fair. It's not equitable. It's not transparent. It's not who we want to be. So we have some issues there. And I think the toughest aspect of leadership is trying to get engagement from people who are very, very good at what they do and very successful and saying, hey, maybe we can get better together. I'm convinced the answer to this is about community and a higher mission. Uh, I think some people I work with think there has to be money involved, maybe. I think it's much better to drive change and increase employment engagement. And you really do this by environment, by culture, and by society. So with that, I thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. All right, All right three, two minutes over, sorry. <laughs> Questions? Do, do we do this here? Or do you put up the doctor's score and publicly show it or how they're doing? In grand rounds, or is it doctor A, B, C, D, E, F, and their names are blinded? So, so, so obviously we do a lot, a lot of this. Uh, we do not put that up in grand rounds with the names. Um, we, we, we tend to put it up the A, B, C, D, F, but then, you know, the individual chairs. Right. Talk, talk to the individual. Right. Uh, so that was a common pushback that we got. And some people said, why don't you just put the top 10 up and not the bottom 10. And so in some departments, we got a little bit softer towards the end and did that. Uh, I found that this to me is just more transparent and honest and really drove behavior. I mean, I, 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 think, I think the big the big issue here is that we're all competitive. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, our, our, our approach was, if you show somebody, if, 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 and again, I think the number one issue, which is why, we may be a little bit behind, but we're getting there, is to make sure you get the right data. Correct. Because the first thing that happens is if you show people numbers and they think it's wrong. They poke you, holes in the data. You lose, you lose them. You lose, you, them. You lose them for Sorry. five years. So Sorry. the first thing you start off are things that you just can't get wrong. On time to the operating room, operative dictations, on time for rounds, uh, surveys from your residents or fellows. Those you just... Those just can't be wrong, right? So we use those to start. Things like observe to expected this or that, we now have iterated to get people really into this. So, and all those are made up of the EQI. Yeah. What kind of time frame do you allow when you need to bring about real culture change in yep. an organization? Such a great question. Uh, because I met with every chair once a month, there were some departments that were really doing this. And I was nothing, it was great. There was nothing for me to do. And there were some that are still resistant four years later. And um, it is cultural and it's leadership. Uh, and I think it's a, it really actually has a lack of accountability and a lack of leadership in some areas not to do this. Uh, so it depends on what you're asking. If you go back to those substrate, those granular substrates, part of it is the genetic makeup of that particular leader and the people they're talking to change. And then part of it is what exactly are you asking them to change? You know, there are some people that are uh, based on a certain age are not going to change what they've been doing every day for 20 years. That's the problem. Yeah. How do you uh, handle an answer that you frequently get when you do this kind of thing that my cases are harder, yeah. mine are more complicated, yeah. mine are more tertiary? I, I love that. You have a length of stay we, of 0 0.26. Yep. How'd yep. you do that? And I get the, I obviously, as the chief, get the hardest cases. It's communication. So it's a touch point. So if you tell the patient and, you know, 15% uh, of my patients come from other countries because they're turned down. If you tell them you're going to go home the, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. When you see them on your first telemedicine, on the morning of surgery, you're going home tomorrow at 8 a.m. When you round and talk to them post-op, you're going home tomorrow at 8 a.m. You go home tomorrow at 8 a.m. because that's what they expect. And you explain to them why it's better for them. 
It's not better to be in the hospital. It's unequivocally worse. You don't sleep. You can get the wrong medicine, get a nosocomial infection. You don't want to be around. You don't want to be discharged when at three or four when there's a problem. So uh, it really is. And, and also I give, and then it drives Tammy crazy, but every patient has my cell phone. So, and I do give people who go home a pulse ox. And if they don't have an eye watch, we find a way if there's a problem uh, to communicate. So even during here, I got four or five texts from patients and they text me usually almost every day for the first week. That prevents readmissions and problems. So I think it's communication and it's dedication to it. Now, I can't scale that. And I've been accused of saying, you know, the, the, a lot of our younger surgeons don't want to do that. They don't want to get texts on Saturday or Sunday or Monday. And I came really close to saying, well, then you shouldn't be a doctor. I haven't said that out loud <laughs> uh, because that's my generation talking and my father who was a doctor and my mother talking. But then you have to find a way to give a sign out that is so specific that you know everything about that patient. And I submit to you, only I know that. I, only I know everything about the family. Oh, that's right, the daughter, the daughter has that issue. She doesn't wanna deal with that. So I have to talk to the son. The only way to really do it, I think, is to, to be available. And you know, the truth is, even in New York City, 99% of people don't abuse the cell phone. Would you agree, Tammy? Mo <laughs> Apparently not. I mean, but most of them don't really abuse it. Most of their questions are pretty reasonable. No, I think. That. Yeah. But Peter, I, I think it goes back to data. I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, the first thing you hear is, well, my, 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 my I'm different. That, that's why I think you need great data, because I think that yeah. you're talking about people who looking at the data will either and, and it's a communication and talking. If they can convince you that they're, they, they are different, which then means that your metrics need to be adjusted, fine, we'll, we'll do that. But more typically, they look at the data and all of a sudden they say, hmm. But you see the beauty of the UQI, they can't say that. Because I say, it's not my data, it's your data. I gave it to you and you vetted it. And then they say, well, you're measuring the wrong. Really? You told me what to measure. So you understand how the EQI works? The two things that doctors did for the first 20 years I did this with, they shot hole in the data. My patients are older, sicker, fatter, weaker, this and that. Okay, great. Measure old, sick, fat, weak. I showed you the war. I mean, I left a lot of slides out, but you got it. We measure all those things and they're all measurable. And then we let you tell us, and you can change the rules anytime you want. It's your game. I'm not going to tell an orthopedic surgeon or a psychiatrist or a, an internist how to measure X, Y, Z. I will give you hospital cost. I will give you length of stay. I'll give you data. We have to publicly report because it costs us money, but you measure that. It's your data. So they can't possibly say that to me because when they say it, I said, it's your data. If you didn't go through your own data, that's your own fault. That's your fault. And if they say, well, you're measuring the wrong things, I'm like, how can I be? You told me what to measure for procedure X, Y, or Z, or condition X, Y. Z. So the EQI wipes that out. It eliminates that by definition. Yes, Jack. First of all, we'll start with Jack as the president of the hospital a couple of years. So, uh, you know, Jack is president of the When you're comparing hospitals, this one's by the uh, Mark does not have the less educated, lower income, higher social determinants of health patients have, that they can go there and he's left with a population that's different in terms of insurance. Yes, absolutely. At Presbyterian Hospital, same. Brigham, same. Thing. So, at NYU, there's the NYU Hospital and there's Bellevue Hospital next door. And I often wonder, I would try to get the surgeons to say, well, can I see your results at NYU Hospital and compare them to your results at Bellevue? Because now we have the same surgeon, but we have different patient population. Now, to measuring severity, my patients are sicker, it used to be at least, you know, what stage is their disease, what are their comorbidities, what is their age, et cetera. But it didn't include the social determinants. I think now the more sophisticated approach yeah. that, that, that tries to include that. But I would just point out 
where we're comparing these different hospitals. I mean, the hospital I ran, uh, Mount Sinai Hospital, we had, it wasn't as close a relationship with Bellevue, it wasn't the same doctors, but we had a metropolitan hospital six blocks away, which was the city hospital. And that soaked up a lot of the Medicaid and the underserved population. So uh, the mark doesn't happen. So I'd say you're right, but I would challenge you to get a book. And book of the highest percentage of Medicaid patients in the world are the same measurements. Yeah, but these are all the measurements. So a COI have nothing to do with Bellevue. That's run by a completely different system, and they have a very different culture than we do. They don't care about being on time to the operating room. When we took over Brooklyn, which is the same population group as Bellevue, that results I just showed you are the best in the world, and we're proud of that. That took us a billion, uh, nine hundred million dollars, a complete change of paper. It took us four years to do. So you can do it. And we've put a lot of our own faculty there and that's where they stay. But we have other problems there. So I think you are right. Uh, and I do think the social determinants make a difference. But in terms of complexity, or we can look at the right ventricular function, left ventricular function. The psychiatrist can tell you the degree of the schizophrenia. We can get rid of those excuses. And so the doctors can't punch holes. They still do, but they can't punch holes in the data as much as they could before. That makes the game fair. That is your wins versus replacement, your war that they have in baseball. We're going to get there in medicine, and it's about patients getting better care. That's what this is about. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Here, do you want me to take that? Thank you, Dr. Serfolio. Congratulations on your award. Um, I just want to mention everybody should consider nominating a colleague, classmate, or friend. And there's a QR code on your program should you want to nominate someone for this award. Um, and we want to thank everybody for your attendance today. And there is lunch after in the FLOM atrium. Thank you and enjoy reunion.